I know I'm a bit late to the party, but since there's very little coverage of networking devices these days, I said why not test the TP-Link AP7073 myself. And so I got my hands on this slim half metal half plastic Wi-Fi 7 access point that rivals ubiquity not only in terms of size but in terms of price and features as well. There is support for the 6 GHz radio that can use up to the 320 MHz channel width, there is multi-link operation support as well as cloud cloud and local management available. Plus we get mesh support and AI roaming, so it does tick pretty much all the boxes. But there is one other feature that I only saw on the far more expensive Zyster WBE660S. We got a 10 gigabit PoE port. I don't really know why the other manufacturers ignore this important piece on their mid to entry level Wi-Fi 7 access points, but TP-Link didn't and this should allow us to see some impressive throughput, right? I do think so, considering that the WB660S outdid all other devices, which means that the AP773 might also have a chance, so let's see it in action. I made a teardown video of the TP-Link AP773 a few months back, and even then I was surprised by how slim the access point was, especially when compared to the EAP670 or the EAP660 HD. So yes, gone are the days of the bulky cases, and I also appreciate that tp -Link went with a metallic bottom for a better heat management. Ingenious and Zyxel have been using this system for years, and it has worked well for them. I suppose Ubiquity is the odd one here, but it's getting there, I hope. Anyway, we're dealing with a ceiling mount access point and there is a bracket in the package to do the actual mounting. You cannot really lay this device on a desk since it will easily slip on the floor. I didn't see an obvious LED but it's there shining through the plastic top showing colors depending on the status of the network and of the access point. I always assume blue and green are good while red and orange are bad. I mean at this point what else can we do, the minimalism craze has taken over everything. Flip the device back and we get to see a sunken area specially dedicated to the ports. There is one Ethernet port which we know is capable of speeds up to 10 gigabits, and it's also PoE of course. Next to it there's a 10 volt DC in port and a small reset button. As I mentioned before, the TP-Link AP773 relies on the bottom metallic part of the case to take away the heat from the main components, and there are no actual ventilation holes. That's the entire system. Does it work? Or would a fan be better, as in the case of the U7 Pro and the U7 Pro Max? The thermal camera that I used here shows that it worked fairly well and the case does not overheat. So, despite being smaller and more compact, there is no need for a fan to keep things under control. Unlike other brands, TP-Link made opening up the case of the EAP773 a breeze. There are 6 screws that need to be removed and that's about all. The top panel should easily pop out. Then we get to see the PCB, but yes, the main components do rest on the other side. I quickly realized that there is no fancy antenna as on the WB660S or even the cheaper NWA130PE, but we do get a good view of the main components. I also added a comparison table with other Wi-Fi 7 access points. I admit that I was expecting the TP-Link AP773 to offer a better throughput than the other Wi-Fi 7 access points in the same price range, and I was right. I did run a few single client tests using Wi-Fi 7, Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 5 client devices, and we can see way over 2 gigabits per second near the access point, but not as much of an impressive throughput at 70 feet or 21 meters. And this stays true as long as I use the Wi-Fi 7 adapter and of course the 6 GHz radio. But switching to the 5 GHz radio made some significant improvements. And it does seem that the TP-Link AP773 is one of the few access points to use the 240 MHz channel bandwidth. The signal attenuation graphic does confirm that it's better to use a 5 GHz radio if you intend to cover more ground with Wi-Fi. And that is true both upstream and downstream, as we can see in the following graphics. I did include a comparison with other access points that I tested over the years and when using the 5GHz radio and the 80MHz channel width, the EAP773 sits in between the Zyxel and WA130BE and the U7 Pro. 
Switching to the 160 MHz channel width, things do change and the EAP773 sits below the more expensive Zyxel WBE660S. I was very curious how would it stand when using the 6 GHz radio and the 320 MHz channel bandwidth, and as you can see it does take the second place. Before moving forward, I think it would be interesting to also check out how the throughput fluctuates over a longer period of time and whether a specific speed is sustained or not. Now let's have a quick look at the data I collected when using the 2.4 GHz radio band and the 40 MHz channel width. I used a Wi-Fi 6 and a Wi-Fi 5 client device, the former performing much better than the latter. Then again, the 2.4 GHz radio is better left for IoT and smart devices at this moment. I have also included a signal attenuation graphic in case you want to reproduce these results in your own home or office. When compared to other access points, the EAP773 is not really a top performer, sitting below the EAP670. That's about all for the single client trials, so let's get a good look at the multi-client test results. I used NetHydra by Mr. Jim Salter once again and using a server PC as well as 5 wireless client devices, I could simulate various types of traffic. I started with 1080p streaming and we can see that the Wi-Fi 7 client did really well, followed by the two Wi-Fi 6 client devices which remained underneath 100 milliseconds for at least 95% of the time. The two Wi-Fi 5 clients climbed above 100 milliseconds for at least 25% of the time, which is a lot. The performance is very similar to that of the Zyxel WB660S and the NWA130BE, but also a bit better than the U7 Pro. Next, I see simulated 4K streaming on 5 client devices and the latency was quite similar to what I saw with the Zyxel NWA130BE and the U7 Pro, which I suppose makes sense considering all are within the same price range. Moving forward, I added intense browsing to run alongside the 1080p streaming and we can see that a couple of clients did perform relatively well. It's not that much different from the Ubiquiti U7 Pro performance. As for the intense browsing, the two Wi-Fi 5 clients did better than the rest, but even those performed within limits. Now, moving on with the 4K streaming and the intense browsing test, only one Wi-Fi 6 client remained beneath 100 milliseconds for almost the entire duration of the test. It's a very similar performance to the WB660S for the most part with only the Zima board performing a bit worse. The intense browsing graphic shows one client going above 3 seconds for at least 5% of the time, which is not really acceptable performance. Let's now include downloaded traffic, and we will be downloading a 10 megabyte file continuously alongside two intense browsing clients and two 4K streaming clients. There is no limit, the clients can use up the entire bandwidth. As you can see, the 4K streaming clients didn't play nice, while the intense browsing was handled well. The downloading client needed 572 megabits per second of throughput and it remained near 100 milliseconds for 95% of the time, which is far better than expected. It was actually better than the WB660S, which was already superior to the U7 Pro and the NWA130BE. With that in mind, let's now add another download client. And things do change. One client rose up from about 190 milliseconds up to 500 milliseconds, while the other is about 100 milliseconds more across the board. Again, while very far from ideal, it's still a better performance than the WBE660S, which is no small feat. The total throughput for the downloading clients was 749.4 megabits per second. Afterwards, I limited the number of clients to 3, but kept one downloading client. This way, we can see that it's not really enough to change things. So I decided to simulate the downloading of a 1 megabyte file, keep the intense browsing client and add a voice over IP one as well. The downloading latency remains below 100 milliseconds, which, although less impressive than what we got with the Zyxel WB660S, it's far better than the U7 Pro. The other two clients were also within reasonable limits. Lastly, I decided to run the downloading traffic on all five clients and, well, you can see the results for yourself. Since pretty much all Wi-Fi 7 access points now have working multilink operation, 
I had to also test it on the TP-Link AP773. I already tested the Ubiquiti 7 Pro, the Zykes and WA-130BE and the WBE-660S, the latter being the best performing one. I have included the throughput for the 6GHz radio using both the 320MHz and the 160MHz channel bandwidth. And after aggregating the 6GHz with the 5GHz radio, the first on the 320MHz, the second on the 240 megahertz channel width, we get almost 4 gigabits per second near the access point. This is indeed the best multilink operation throughput I have experienced so far. Then again, the throughput does lose its potency after I increase the distance. Using the 160 megahertz for the 5 gigahertz radio and either the 320 megahertz or the 160 megahertz channel width for the 6 gigahertz radio, show the max throughput closer to 3 gigabits per second, which is in line with the other Wi-Fi. 7 access points. Downstream we can see that the performance follows the same ups and downs, with a more subdued throughput. You may have noticed that I did not aggregate the 2.4 GHz radio, and the reason I didn't is because this option is not available in the software. It would have helped with the throughput when there is more distance between the client and the access point, so hopefully it will become available in the future. Lastly, I decided to also include the results that I got while running Flint. Well, let's check out the software options. There is a standalone mode available and does offer pretty much everything you need to configure and monitor the network. There are four main tabs, the first being the status, which shows info about the device, the SSIDs, the radios, as well as about the clients that are connected to the access point. Then we get the wireless tab, where we can set up the radios and the SSIDs, and yes, this is where we can also configure the multilink operation. Of course, we also get a captive portal, VLAN support, quality of service, rogue AP detection, and more. The next tab is the management, where we can set up the IP, check the logs, configure the access ports, control the LADs, and some more options. Under system, we can update the account, update the firmware, and enable the cloud-based controller management. I did have available hardware controller, the OC200, which made things easy for me but you can also run the Omega SDN locally on a PC. In my case, the AP773 was detected automatically and I had to insert the username and password that I previously set up. Then, after some firmware upgrades, I could see the user interface. I did mention several times over the years that TP-Link was aiming at ubiquity, and I think it landed because the controller is now much more mature than it was before, and there is support for lots of new types of devices. The Unify familiarity is still strong, as we can see the access point dedicated section on the right side, while on the left we can check the dashboard for global status info, the statistics area, and there is also a map. On the devices we get to see our access point and there is a dedicated client section. I suppose I should mention the insights and the logs, both important sections to understand what's going on with the network. But let's now check out that dedicated section for the AP773. We have five main sections here, starting with the details, which covers everything from radios to the LAN and uplink status info. Then there's the client section, which does include the log history, followed by the mesh section, which will cover potential mesh network, which I don't currently have configured. Next, we get to the config section, where we actually get to set up how things work, starting from radios, SSIDs, VLANs, and going to some advanced options that include quality of service and OFDMA. Lastly, we can check out the statistics, where we get some live monitoring tools available. It took me a bit longer than expected to finally test the AP773, but we got here eventually. And we discovered that the AP773 offers a lot of value for the money and is perhaps one of the best Wi-Fi 7 access points out there within the entry to mid-level hardware segment. In my tests, it did better than the U7 Pro and it even went closer to the WB660S in some aspects. The software got better over the years, so I see little reason why this access point Point won't end up on your shortlist. That's about all for now. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.